Uh, former governor of Sokoto State, Dr. Tairu Delitu Beforawa, in a press statement has called on political, the political class, I should say, well many Nigerians to desist from comments and actions that could lead uh, to more disarray in the country. He noted that the agitation for the rotation or zoning of the presidency has become Nigeria's political quagmire. He calls on numerous social political commentators across uh, the country to delve less into politics that separates the people and instead offer more constructive advice on how best the government uh, could get the country out of its current situation. According to him, all energy should be channeled into offering solutions to solve the problems of insecurity and socioeconomic problems in order to douse the tension in the atmosphere brought about by the present predicament of insecurity and similar problems. The former governor says Nigeria should imbibe the culture of reducing political bickering, agitations, or sounding the drums of war. Tundu, your views on this? Well, I take a different position from the former governor, and mm. thankfully we can all take a position. Positions are not necessarily actionable. We all have an opinion. But I always just find it curious that the cause of, oh, there's no need for zoning, zoning is unnecessary, only happen when it's time for the presidency to be zoned to the south. How convenient is that? And some of those tensions that he rightly referred to are caused by the fact that there's a perception, perception being reality most of the time, mm -hmm. that in this kind of Orwellian fashion, some animals are more equal than others. So people do feel that there's a perception that the South is marginalized, especially the Southeast. So it, it is time to actually adhere to that zoning formula in the interest of fair play and balance. So I'm not sure I agree with his views. All right, Dr. Vati. Well, you recall that uh... Uh, Governor Atahiru Bafarawa of Sokoto State, as he then was, was in the PDP, the People's Democratic Party. And then he was one of those persons who crossed uh, to the um, All Progressives Congress. And he's been in uh, politics uh, for a very long time. So what he has done is to express an opinion. But the opinion that he has expressed, I guess, well, one, at one level, he's entitled to it. This is a time when every Nigerian is expressing an opinion, which is why we find it very strange that those who use a platform like Twitter or any other platform to express an opinion are being uh, constricted under Section 39 of the Constitution, under Section 36, subsection 12 of the Constitution, and are being told that as citizens, they cannot express themselves. So I see uh, this opinion expressed by... Uh, you know, Governor Atahiru ba Bafarawa of Sokoto State, as he then was, as a way of expressing his own opinion. But the point that he has raised about rotational presidency is a very sensitive issue. There are many Nigerians who believe that rotational presidency is very important in Nigeria, in a country of over, as Onigo Chite, uh, Professor Onigo Chite has told us in his uh, uh, frontline research in that regard, has over 450 ethnic nationalities. If you have over 450 ethnic nationalities, then your main challenge, as has also been pointed out repeatedly in various uh, conferences in this country, is that you have to defend the interest of other units of the Federation to ensure that they have a sense of belonging, that they, you ensure that they think that the Nigerian Federation is equitable, that you ensure that everyone has a sense of belonging, even more important, a sense of ownership. We are at a point in Nigeria now where, whereby many Nigerians don't think Nigeria belongs to them. Some people have been talking about UAR, one fictitious uh, country called the United African Countries or United Akaban uh, Country. They even want to change the name of the country. A bigger uh, segment of the population has been uh, emigrating to Canada, to other places where they think that uh, they will get a better life. One uh, uh, former musician, Eddie Dunn, was accused of not uh, getting involved in the Nigeria matter. Eddie Dunn uh, uh, re responded on Twitter and said, no, you people should deal with it. I've opted out of that, your problematic arrangement in Nigeria. And now here you have uh, Governor Bafarawa saying, nobody should talk about those big issues that affect Nigerians. Nigerians there are Nigerians who think secession is uh, a solution. There are Nigerians who think separatism is the solution. There are Nigerians who think that, in fact, this arrangement is not working. So people are just saying we cannot be forced to accept 
the present arrangement? Mm. What has ignited it? What has catalyzed it? There are people who believe strongly that, look, the uh, Buhari administration is a culmination, the, the, the catalyzation, the climax, to use a simpler word, of all the problems that have afflicted Nigeria. And that they've not seen leadership in terms of how to hold the country together. Mm. So Governor Bafarawa, as he then was, may have spoken out of patriotism mm. to say, look, uh, nobody should talk about secession, nobody should talk about rotation, nobody should talk about zoning. But Tunu is absolutely right. Is he speaking out of the concern that power should remain in the north? Sunday Bo will not agree. Namde Kano will not agree. Other people will not agree. Right? Yes. Is he speaking out of self-interest? Because he's a man who has shown interest in the leadership of Nigeria previously. Oh, so is Governor Bafarawa saying, look, if you people keep talking about separatism and zoning and rotation, maybe, maybe you want to uh, object to my presidency of Nigeria. Every Nigerian born here or abroad or who has citizenship under Chapter 3 of the uh, Constitution of Nigeria should be, uh, you know, uh, it should be possible for such persons to lead Nigeria. Yes. Yes. So this idea of a born to rule, <laughs> that it's only some people who can rule Nigeria, that's what many Nigerians are fighting against. Mm. And I think all informed persons, I don't talk about opinionated persons, persons who just have a platform and they just express ignorant views, should be able to say, look, public opinion should be about justice, should be about equity, should be about intelligence. And there's so much ignorance going around. Oh, yeah. So much ignorance to go around, I should say. But that's why. All right, Steve is here. That's all on news headlines. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Rhodes to during Michael Wilson. Uh, this will more on Aaron Akira. Let's give us updates on Africa, global business, COVID-19, and spotting activities across the globe. Stay with us. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Our dependable Rhodes to is here to give us Africa business update. Over to you, Rhodes. Good morning, Tundu. Good morning, Rufai. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, Good morning. to all our viewers on this uh, Money Monday on the uh, Africa Business Update on the Morning Show. Lots to go through. First of all, the Central Bank of Nigeria has announced that they've increased foreign exchange allocations to deposit money banks. Apparently, there was a meeting over the weekend between Godwin Mefele and uh, managing directors and heads of a number of banks. Apparently, he warned them that they should not hold back on providing FX to Nigerians for PTA, personal travel allowance, business travel allowance, medical needs, school fees, education, and the like. Uh, so the central bank is trying to do its best. Now, remember last week, we talked about them promising to allocate foreign exchange to manufacturers. Now, they are increasing allocations um, to deposit money banks to get foreign exchange at the NAFEX rate, 410, 411, uh, to, to Nigerians. If they are successful in doing that, it will probably bring down the parallel market rate, which recently has surged to 495. doesn't make any sense since, again, all they did was replace the um, previous rates that wasn't really being used with the NAFEX rate at 410. I think speculators are taking advantage of that. To Zimbabwe, similar, well, different situation, but also FX. Um, the Deputy uh, Finance Minister Clemens Chidua in Zimbabwe has said they might ban traders from access to foreign exchange auctions because of round tripping. Um, they are taking that in, in Zimbabwe, what it is, is they are taking, going to auctions, participating, getting a foreign exchange at the official rate, and then, which is at a lower price, and then going to the black market to sell it, round tripping and making profits of that. So Zimbabwe is threatening to shut off traders from their foreign exchange of auctions if they continue with, those, uh, with, the, with round tripping. Uh, to the NNPC, the NNPC has uh, said that underfunded projects in April as a result of subsidy costs has uh, amounted to about 26 billion naira in underfunded projects. They talk about exploration services, brash LNG supply project, Nigeria Morocco uh, pipeline. Because of the cost of subsidy, the NNPC to the tune of 26 billion naira has not been able to fund the number of projects in the month of April, and that could continue. Oil prices are continuing to rise. Onions, I, saw, I just saw this. Um, effective today, uh, onion producers, managers of Nigeria, Opman, have threatened that if the security situation does not improve in the southeast, effective today, they will cut off sales of onions to the southeastern part of Nigeria. There was a truck 
um, that was um, destroyed or you know captured by people they suspect they suspect to be members of IPOB that happened uh, uh, last week. So they're saying that if the state governments in the southeast don't do something, they're mm -hmm. going to cut off onion supplies, and that's going to push up prices uh, for uh, for onions. Um, Dangote fertilizer, uh, as far as the 2.5 billion dollar fertilizer plant uh, is going to effectively begin sales today, Monday. This was announced by Aliko Dangote, chairman of the Dangote Group, uh, on a visit uh, for in the Ibejuleki plant, the fertilizer plant from the Central Bank Governor of Nigeria. So that's going to begin. We're looking at about 3 million metric tons of um, uh, urea. Uh, that's much needed foreign exchange. Dangote said they've gotten all the licenses they need from the National Security Advisor, Ministry of Agriculture, Standard Association of Nigeria, um, NAFTAC, and so on. So they should begin sales uh, today. Much needed FX for, for fertilizer. USSD, remember we had this conversation about USSD um, with, between the telcos and the banks, 40 billion being owed to the telcos, not being remitted by the banks. The CBN stepped in, NCC stepped in. And so effective, I believe effective today, the, the new 6 Naira 98 cover USSD charge takes effect. And some people have already gotten um, notifications to that effect. If you spend a 20 second or 25 second session using USSD, you're going to get that new charge. Finally, the FIRS, Federal Inland Revenue Service, says that they are streamlining a new tax initiative online to enable a more streamlined process of tax payment for Naira denominated payments for corporations in Nigeria. And that is our okay. African business okay. for today. Okay, Rotus, I mean, exciting insights, lots and lots of stories, but I'll just, uh, for the want of time, I'll just quickly pick uh, some stories. Uh, number one will be the Dangote Group, very good one, kudos to them. Uh, churning out urea, much needed, you know, for the agricultural sector in this country. Uh, with them and companies like Indorama and some other, you know, chemical producing companies that are churning out good bases with fertilizer and urea, we can go one step further. Uh, for me, why is it that there's an imbalance in the onion system in this country or the, the system of, uh, you know, distribution of onion? Any small thing, uh, the market has a feel of it. If you remember, a couple of months back, there was this same onion uh, problem with onion, you know, that the prices skyrocketed, went over 200% in no time. And now this blockade will increase the price. And the knock-on effect for me will be the fact that we keep complaining that food inflation is on the rise. And with this onion ban, if it, if it takes uh, full effect, then food prices will go up because you need onion for almost right. everything in our staple in this country. Well, very quickly. Let me start with onions. Correct, correct. That is now, correct. onions, uh, very important source of uh, antioxidants, very important source of uh, vitamin B, uh, also a uh, very important uh, element uh, in terms of the production of potassium. But what we have in terms of production in this country is that parts of the country have a comparative advantage. The comparative advantage points to one fact, that we all need each other in this country. There are things that are produced in the north that are useful to the south. There are things that are produced in the south of Nigeria that are useful to the north. Now, what you find is a divided country as a result of, uh, well, you can put it down to leadership issues. You can put it down to political will. You can put it down to the unresolved questions about the amalgamation, about the national question. And now you have Southerners saying, look, it is our oil. We will not give it to you. And you have Northerners saying, it is our onion. It's not only about onions. It's also about tomatoes. We produce onions. We produce tomatoes in the north. We produce more rice in the north. If you Southerners are saying you will hold on to your own, you want to leave Nigeria, we too will hold on to our own. And all of that is tied to the security challenge in Nigeria. And what it all means is that the urgent issue that we face in Nigeria today is how to see how to merge all these advantages that have kept us together. Because in spite of whatever may have divided us, we still have commonalities. We still have a way in which we are dependent on each other. So if we don't have onions uh, again in Nigeria, how many states in southern Nigeria are producing uh, onions? So would there be a vitamin B? deficiency uh, in uh, the southern part of Nigeria? Would there be a potassium deficiency in the uh, uh, southern part of Nigeria? Would there be other deficiencies in the northern part of Nigeria? Nigeria, according to analysts, and I think it's a reasonable point, is an informed opinion, stands at the edge of the precipice. And that's why what is required right now is not just about people being emotional. It's about leadership. 
It's about political will. It's about people stepping into the fray and saying, this union, we will not allow it to disintegrate because there is, because there is absent-mindedness. Wow. That, for me, is a major challenge. Well, for potassium, you could go peel a banana. But I do, <laughs> oh, yeah. I do sympathize okay, with so the onion. we can all become monkeys. Well. Nigeria. But I do, but I do sympathize with the onion right. producers. You'll recall the tragic um, story, the assassination of Ahmed Gulak. In that account of how the police reportedly killed his um, killers, they were found sharing onions. That was, the, that was the story. So it appears that they had waylaid a truck with onions and were sharing the onions to the people in the area. Now, that is somebody's labor, somebody's sweat they were just sharing. What was expected was that those onions should go to a market. So that Onion Association is correct to highlight the threats to their lives and to their property, and it needs to be looked into. As Dr. Abati said, everybody here, nobody is more important than the other person. We all have equal rights in Nigeria to our safety, our security. It's extremely right. important, this story. Well, I think we've run out of time, Rotas, but indeed. thank well, you for and that. These are perishable goods. Onions and tomatoes are perishable goods. Mm -hmm. Yes. Moving on now to more business updates. Michael Wilson joins us now from London. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is all about inflation this week. And uh, the given that Friday's uh, non-farm payroll figures in the United States are what they call Goldilocks, neither too hot nor too cold, really. That's the that's the, the, the market. Uh, and meanwhile, so that didn't cause an enormous amount of discussion, but the discussion still continues clearly about inflation. Be more on that this week. And meanwhile, G7 leaders, as you know, reached a deal, as they could it, on multinationals to pay more tax. Um, it was hailed as a triumph, but I think there's a lot more detail in there still to be done. But we'll We'll, we'll come on to that, and no doubt you particularly want to talk about that too. Um, Asia Pacific, therefore, relatively mixed, basically, given those figures, waiting on what's going to happen in the rest of the markets around the world. Very much a wait and see, uh, move, a, a very mixed picture in uh, in, in Asia. Um, Janet Yellen has been talking about uh, she'd like slightly higher interest rates, but she she bracketed that by also saying that she'd like that, but only if it's going to show it showing about growth and so on. So that that's been relatively quiet um, as far. As far as uh, with, with no um, uh, overall theme then, you know, waiting for the Northern Hemisphere to, to wake up, basically, China's trade surplus shrinks. Now, that would be normally seen as bad news. I don't think it is at all. I think it shows that, that their imports are actually growing and that's helping people around the rest of the world to import into China. A huge appetite for commodities and so on. And uh, not, not, we're not bothered about their export growth. We're bothered about what we can actually sell to them. Because, as you've just been saying, we live in a, in a world of interconnection. Um, so therefore, the global highlights this week will be China inflation data on Wednesday, US inflation data on Thursday, and also the, the ECB as well. So that, that's sort of bubbling under, and that's keeping discussion going if the market data actually is a bit thin. As far as Singapore's concerned, now this is interesting, Flex. Flex is the third large, uh, third world, th third largest chip manufacturer in the world. They're in Singapore and they're warning a chip shortage could last until 2022. So therefore, we can expect um, car and consumer products to be uh, disrupted and, until that kind of state. So it's going to be a story really for the, for the rest of the year. We know why this has happened because the consumer rebound, number one, people wanted to buy laptops and gaming consoles during the lockdown and B, people were very unprepared for the way in which economies would uh, rebound back after the lockdown. So just to recap in the United States, then those jobs figures are very, very slight miss. But the important thing here, I don't think is about the numbers. It's actually, we sort of discussed this on the programme before. It's given the high rate of government help is actually stopping people or saying to people, why should we go to work? There is that. The, old, the other kind of thing is also childcare costs as well. That's something which has not been factored into people's thoughts about. And this is very important important indeed because families have got much closer together during the pandemic and now both parents going out to work and so well, how are we going to pay for child child care costs i think that's going to be very very important to discuss those kind of social things in the way to come fomc meeting on june the 16th um and again that that's not really until unless that's quite a way away so not a lot of uh, data really to get one's teeth into and and to talk about that you know i i've headlined this idle hands fiddle fiddle with meme stuff Stocks. Yes, they do. And what's been happening is that a lot of social media talk now, idle hands, there they are, playing with, with stocks. They're, they're kind of thinking, well, there's no big data at the moment, so let's get on social media and let's pump up things. Let's, let's play up 
being private punters. And that's what's happening at the moment. Um, I don't think that's a very good move, quite honestly. And I think that bubble is about to burst. I said that Janet Yellen recently said that she would, she said that over the weekend, she'd welcome higher interest rates. She's only saying that because we hope that what she's saying, not because she likes higher interest rates, who likes higher interest rates? What she's saying is if they're an indication of growth, they're actually quite good. So the global G7 tax agreement, is it really historic? Has it actually succeeded? It's about two pillars, basically. It's about a global minimum tax of 15%. Now, remember, that's right underneath the sort of target that we were talking about in the United States, or what Joe Biden was talking about initially when he came to power, talking about 28% minimum. So they haven't achieved a great deal there. Does it actually put tax havens out of business? And what about the countries that actually have lower than 15% tax right now? What are they going to do? So there's a load of loopholes to be discussed here. I suspect that it, this is not this. Well, it is an historic mm -hmm. agreement because you, you wouldn't have got the G seven countries close to anything like that uh, during the pandemic but now they are is there a lot more debate to come yes there will be i have no doubt about that whatsoever are you talking to me uk's uh, you are i'll finish there then thank you uh okay go ahead michael i just wanted to come in there but go ahead all right uh right so fact two Two or three final stories. Uh, UK Uber ride hailing business back to pre-pandemic levels. That's good news, basically, because people are off out again. And that's happening not just in London, not just in places outside London, but also uh, selected areas in the EU as well. So Europe doing relatively well uh, in terms of people actually getting out and about. Travellers, whole other story. We won't probably talk about that today because we've been doing that over uh, the past few days. But, you know, that there's an enormous amount of confusion about where people can actually go. Oil prices, you know, sort of drifting around really nothing too hot nothing too cold from those jobs figures on friday and gold trying to get above 1900 dollars an ounce again the inflation narrative will have a lot to do with what we think about gold but i suspect we're going to leave that until the end of the week that's the global view this morning Good all right morning. all right thank you so much for that michael michael i'd like to know what happens to ireland then and some other countries that made a lot of money by reducing taxes and having special tax deals because and, and what has happened to the world I mean, the swinging 60s and the 70s, corporate tax used to go as much as 50% corporate tax. What happened? All of a sudden, it's 15%. What has changed? Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think a lot has changed. I mean, we talk about 15 percent. I've just been saying I think it's going to take a while for that actually to to happen. And does it close that? Does it close down tax loopholes? Does it stop highly paid tax accountants trying to make sure that companies don't pay too much? Is the are they actually going to do this most important thing, which is that sovereign countries can actually tax the sales of high tax companies in their company? That's why all this is different. Will that happen? It's got a long way to go. It's got to go to the got to go to the summit, got to be agreed by the summit this, this coming weekend in Cornwall, then to the G20, then to the OECD. And we've heard from a lot of, com of companies, uh, countries saying, this is not enough. We need more. So what this is supposed to do is to actually draw on the high earning companies around the world to make sure that the low earning companies get some kind of um, recompense to help them through the pandemic. That's, that is uh, the, the most, that's the earliest target of all this kind of thing. What about Ireland? 12.5% corporation tax right now yeah precisely what will they do will they say oh yes we'll have 15 percent tax and lose their advantage or or will they be encouraged and this is what the oecd have been saying this morning is to change their actual business model i think it'll take quite a lot to do that and there'll be a lot of countries like ireland worried about the fact that they're actually attracting big companies because they have low corporate tax a lot of discussion to take place you're absolutely right well very quickly still on the same subject um how historic is this likely to be, considering the fact that the OECD will still have to take a look at this, the G20 will still have to look, take a look at this. Uh, what we have at the moment is the G7 uh, appearing to be reaching uh, a consensus of 15% uh, uh, on uh, corporation tax. Uh, will that play out on the uh, global uh, stage, or we're likely to have further uh, negotiations? before? 15% uh, agreement by the G7, what we had was 19%. What, are, what is likely to be the fallout? Now, this week, on Friday, there's likely to be a meeting of the uh, G7 in Cornwall in the United Kingdom for three days. Uh, what are the likely fallouts in that uh, regard? And Janet Yellen and the United States, has been talk they've both been talking about uh, economies of the world, stimulating their economies, to ensure post-pandemic uh, recovery. 
Now, yes, it's easy for the developed countries of the world to talk about, okay, uh, you know, reflect your economy, do things with your economy, provide more stimulus. Okay, how about low to middle income countries? Where do we stand in that regard? So the G20 will be the big challenge, I think, because you've got Russia and China in there. <clears throat> the reason that they're calling it historic, Doctor, is because it is historic. It's an historic agreement in inverted commas, because, as I said, nothing like this would have happened during the pandemic. But it's as countries come out of it, realise that the big debts they have to pay, they see corporate big corporations making a lot of money and they're not getting their hands on their tax. Then that's why it's historic. The agreement is that there should be a minimum 15 percent. Will that get in, run into a lot of trouble? Yes, of course it will. The G20 still has to do it. As you quite rightly say, you said that. And also the OECD, they haven't discussed this yet. <clears throat> we're, just, we're just hearing, we'll be hearing more today of what the OECD actually thinks about this. So there's a lot of discussion. And you're quite right, of course, yes. The G7, who are the G7? Why, I mean, I still think the G7 is a very outmoded thing. I, I first did a G7, you know, right at the beginning of my career, which is a long, long time ago. I don't, you know, it's, it, did, it started to be G8, then it included it included the, the post-Soviet Union uh, Russia. That that seems to have got, gone by the board. And what, what about moderate companies? What about emerging economies? A lot of question marks about this. So you're going to hear some of this from G20. I I don't think it, it will achieve its target, which is to dis, which is to dissipate the, the 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 wealth which is concentrated in parts of the world by large corporations like the big tech companies, and make sure that that is paid to poorer nations around the world. That is what this ought to be about. Now, it, you can say that I, I think the agreement's been historic. The actual implementation of it, and that's the most important thing. You put your finger on it. That is going to be the difficult thing. Well, thank you, Mr. Wilson. We don't have much time left, but I just want to make a comment based on what you said about childcare impacting U.S. jobs figures. And it's interesting to note that even in the childcare industry, workers are leaving in droves, realizing post-pandemic or well during a pandemic that it's actually crucial to have health insurance, which is not offered by most daycare facilities. So they've been lured by other jobs and not going back, which is causing a crisis. And also, I'm not sure if you caught uh, Mitt Romney waxing nostalgic about how his mother was able to stay at home and raise him, billionaire Mitt Romney, from a very well-to-do family, completely out of touch with the reality of most people. But, you know, politicians sometimes are. Well, thank you yeah, for that. You, we call, call it we, 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 we call it a tin ear. You know, it's those uh -huh. people who, pardon, what are you saying? You know, not, not really understanding what they actually, what, what, what the general public actually thinks. You're absolutely right. I think okay. the childcare thing is enormous. It's a big issue. Let's talk about it later. We should. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Michael Wilson. Just like another baby billionaire called Donald Trump, always out of touch with everything real on ground. But thank you so much for your time, Michael, and the team here to learn, Dr. About it. For updates on COVID-19 pandemic, Adesua is doing a great job at this, I could tell you that for free. Adesua, how are you doing? Very well, thank you so much, Rufai. Thank you, Dr. Abati, and good morning, uh, Tundu, as well. Good morning, Dr. Abati. Now, the overall COVID-19 caseload has uh, topped 173 million globally, uh, with at least 3.7 million deaths. Over 2 billion uh, doses of the COVID-19 vaccines have been administered uh, globally. Some scientists are describing the Delta variant. Re recall the Delta variant was first identified in India. They're describing it as a wild card because it's fueling a sharp rise in cases in some countries where it has been recorded. Uh, they say its transmissibility uh, should be worrying for the world as vaccination drive remains highly uneven across the globe. Uh, we are also beginning to see some of the strictest lockdowns since the pandemic began. Even on the continent of Africa, Uganda, starting today, uh, we see schools closed, uh, church services suspended, weekly markets suspended, and of course some interstate travel uh, in the country have been suspended for the next 42 days. Here in Nigeria, 11 cases of the coronavirus were recorded in the last 24 hours according to the NCDC data. I am unable, unfortunately, to bring you vaccination update this morning because the NPHCDA, the primary agency, had uh, previously posted its data on Twitter. And no thanks uh, to the internet uh, lockdown, uh, internet blockade on Twitter, and of course the federal government Twitter ban, I'm unable to access uh, the data if the NPHCDA posted anything at all. Uh, well, in a boost for Africa, Senegal, 
could begin producing vaccine next year under an agreement with a Belgian company uh, called Universals. Under this agreement, the Institute Pasteur in Dakar, the Seneg uh, Senegalese uh, capital, would initially begin packaging and distributing vaccines produced by Universals in Belgium early next year. And then Universal says it may actually move its production line to the country in the second quarter of 2022, and the company will hope to train the staff in Senegal so that they can eventually take over production of the vaccine. So that's good news there for the African continent as it struggles to vaccinate. Uh, to the UK, where Prime Minister Boris Johnson is asking world leaders to commit to vaccinating the world against COVID-19 by the end of 2020. Uh, Boris Johnson, who is hosting the first in-person summit of the G7 in two years, will use the meeting to lay out his targets. Now, the UK has pledged to give its unused excess doses to the world, but it hasn't said how many it is going to give. Uh, there's been some responses from some of the G7 leaders. They say vaccine sharing can only happen when domestic situation permits it. We've talked about vaccine nationalism and how, with every other thing, charity begins at home, including with the pandemic. And finally, to India, where the capital and the economic hub, Maharashtra, uh, the two of the worst affected places in the country, have announced easing of restrictions in a phased manner. India's seven-day average of new cases was 130,000. 648 as of Sunday. Uh, the country has recorded nearly 350,000 deaths from the virus. Guys. So a great story coming out of Senegal, but sad story. Shall I tell you why? Why? Institute Pasteur is still owned by the Global Pasteur Institute that is domiciled in France. Mm -hmm. So it's not still African tech. It's not still African technology. It's not homegrown institution. Mm -hmm. It's still foreign-run, foreign-funded institution Hence the flexibility. The big question is, when are we going to grow something from within, not the West coming to domicile and institution from within, when are we going to grow our own from within, we can manage it and effectively run it. Africa needs to create its own more like Institut de Pasteur out of Senegal that are run by Africans, that are domiciled, that are run by government money, then we can improve research. There's a way to follow. Cuba has done it. Mm -hmm. Cuba did it out of nothing. We should learn from that. Well, on the contrary, the uh, uh, literature is different. What the literature tells us is that, look, a, a number of countries in Africa are the ones who have shown a capacity to be able to engage in vaccine production. Mm -hmm. What are these countries? Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, South Africa, Senegal. And, you know, some of these countries, they've been engaging other vaccine production countries in the world including Chinese companies, as in the case of Morocco, Egypt, and Algeria, and Senegal is the latest to join them. In the case of Senegal, Senegal is joining a Belgian company called uh, Universals. Universals. Yes. And the plan is to start a first phase whereby, uh, you know, the uh, company in Senegal will just be doing packaging and uh, reproduction. And by 2022, the plan is to make sure that that company, I'm not being allowed to make a comment. <laughs>